In today's video, I'm going to show you everything you need to build a smart home. I'll make sure you understand what it is you need to be successful and what you can do with all of these products. This will get you pointed in the right direction, no matter who you are and what technical capability you have. If you don't know me, welcome to Automate Your Life. I'm Brian and I help people use technology to save time and money. So how to build a smart home the right way is really important to me. There are time codes below in the description so you can jump to the section most interesting to you today and you should bookmark this video so you can refer back at any time in order to move forward in your journey. As you try and build a smart home, you're going to run into a lot of terms and definitions that you might not understand. That's why I put together a document with the 25 biggest definitions that you'll need as you go about this journey. So you can download that document at the link below. And if you need more help than that, there's always the comment box, which I always respond to. Let's go through what you can expect a smart home to do. This is one of the biggest misunderstandings today as expectations don't mirror what can happen and it's really hard to nail down at any specific time as the industry as a whole shifts very quickly. New ideas are being brought to the market all the time too. However, there are some basic things that you can expect out of every home outfitted with smart technology. The most important thing for me is that a smart home saves you that time. In a lot of cases, items like smart lawnmowers or smart vacuums and smart mops save us the most time. These can take tasks that take us a half an hour or more every week and turn them into tasks we don't have to do at all. However, not all smart technology that you bring into your life is going to save you time. But what I love is when my home and life becomes less complex to manage. And I won't lie and tell you that this is easy to achieve or this is what you will achieve in all cases because you can run into problems with these products. But when done correctly, you don't have to think about your lights coming on and off at the right times. You don't have to worry that you're bleeding money through power usage and you don't have to worry about whether or not your home is safe and secure. You can also automate tasks that you would normally have to think about and you can even be prompted to do things when you might otherwise forget. When we talk about being safe and secure, we are talking about understanding more of what is happening in and around your home. A smart home can include many devices that improve your security and you can either self monitor that or you can pay someone else to monitor it just like any other security system. On that note, you will find use cases like safe package delivery or just not missing a package becomes something that you can ensure. Today, with the right combo of products, you can have a package delivered into a secure box on your front porch after a short conversation with a delivery person. You can also have them deliver it inside your home with the right smart door lock and video camera combination. One of my favorite use cases for all of these products is that my home knows when we are not home. Then my security system turns on and I get more notifications about what's going on around my home. Smart thermostats respond and manage homes more efficiently as they know when people have left and don't use energy that isn't necessary. Even better is that smart thermostats can work with additional sensors in rooms in your home to better balance the heat or cooling energy you are spending. What we are really talking about here is environmental control and we can get different kinds of environmental control including humidity control, air quality, lighting control and more with sensors and appliances that provide those benefits in an automated manner. A smart home can often mean convenience or improved experiences as I think we've all been there. It's late at night, you don't want to get up but you need a light or you need something to change. This is where things like push buttons, more conveniently placed, can be a big help. Or they can give you more sophisticated control than just a simple on-off switch. Smart homes can provide improved experiences through giving you scenes and or moods to set with loads of smart products working together to create a set of effects or a look and feel in your space. 
This is especially true when we integrate smart TVs, smart streaming sticks, specialized lighting products, and those environmental controls all together. Speaking of managing the mood, one of the most sought after features is the management of sunlight. You can go from very simple devices that move curtains all the way to full smart home blind and shade solutions that transform your home and the way it's lit up in a matter of moments. Today, many smart homes employ smart speakers that allow full home music playing without wires or those speakers can be used in tandem with your entertainment systems too. They can also be the doorbell for your home and are just general data or general smart home request devices as you can call up the voice assistant at any time and that's with a wake word and then make a request that is usually accurately answered. But when we talk about smart speakers, they lack some of the more in-depth features that you will want in your smart home. It's not that controlling by voice is a bad idea or the basic automation options that those smart speakers have are bad. It's just that to mimic what you will want to mimic in your life, a smart home hub tends to be important. It lets you do deeper and more sophisticated automations that aren't just based off of a single event. I'll explain what that means in a bit, but smart home hubs range from fairly easy to incredibly difficult to use, but as it gets more difficult to use, you tend to get more detailed automations. So to summarize, a smart home can automate many tasks and it can automate many boring or painstaking things in your life. It can help you control costs over time and it will bring additional security and safety. Plus it can provide real benefits as it manages the environment that you live in and can simply provide more fun and more interesting experiences within your home. So how does a smart home work? I'm gonna start with an oversimplification of things, but then we will get deeper and deeper into how this all works. I think the first thing to understand is what an automation is. We would define it as something happening after an event occurs. So it's cause and effect. But the terms you will deal with as you go down this road are a bit different, and I will explain through the age-old art of, well, making boxes on a page. Here is the anatomy of an automation. An automation starts when a specific event occurs. We call that event a trigger. Once that trigger occurs, we have some device, whether it's a smart speaker or a hub or another processor that recognizes this event as having occurred. That event is a signal to our hub that something else needs to occur. We call that effect in our cause and effect relationship an action. And in almost every case, you can have multiple actions happen. So with this in mind, let's say you arrive home and you want to unlock your door and turn your thermostat to 72 degrees Fahrenheit, or more appropriately, 20 degrees Celsius. You arriving home is that trigger event and your actions you have chosen are changing the thermostat and unlocking your front door. But let's say you only want that to happen if you arrive home and it's before the sun has gone down. So that means you want it to be before dusk. We would call this second requirement for your automation to run a condition. In many hubs and in many systems, you can have multiple conditions and then a trigger event. In fact, we can probably call all of the conditions uh, and, and the trigger itself just conditions. And in many systems today, you can choose for all the conditions to be true in order for an automation to run, or you can choose for just one of those conditions to be true in order to start an automation. It's important to know that some automation systems will let you only do one condition, while others will let you do many. Some automation systems will have conditions like the time of day, while others will not. Some will have the conditions or trigger events that you're hoping for, and others will not. And the differences get deeper between systems, hubs, and the devices you buy. So this is one of the moments in your journey that really matters. When you buy the wrong thing, you'll be disappointed. In the past section, I showed you the basics of an automation, but how does that even get started? And even better, why is that even important to you? I'm going to explain how an automation gets started, but why it's important is because without understanding this, your troubleshooting when something goes wrong will be severely lessened and 
When you understand this, you will plan out the makeup of your home better. As for how an automation gets started, we know that a trigger event occurs and then some processing happens and our actions occur. However, it feels like a bit of magic until we talk about the hardware involved. In this example, I'm going to use something that I've shown very often, which is a motion sensor seeing motion. That's what you would call a trigger event in most cases, and actually you can use the reverse. So uh, a motion sensor not seeing motion as your trigger event. Even better, in some systems, you can use your motion sensor not seeing motion for a time period as your trigger event, which is kind of like having a trigger and a condition. That motion sensor will use some form of technology to do its job. And in the case of most modern motion sensors, that is passive infrared technology, which is to say, in a simplified way, it's going to sense heat in its viewfinder, sort of like Predator, but less cool. Once it has decided that it has sensed motion, its job is to report that. There are many wireless communication technologies today that could be used by the motion sensor to send that out. It's going to be reporting that motion detection in a way that will be understood by the next component. The next component is best described as a controller because it is really what is managing those trigger events, those conditions, those actions, and pretty much everything has to be connected to it in one way or another in order for it to make what you want happen. Controllers will often be called a hub, smart speaker, border router, Wi-Fi router, and more. What might surprise you these days is that some apps can be used as a controller. Whatever your controller is, it acts as the brain of your home. The good news is that you don't necessarily have to have just one controller. And even better news is that if you do have multiple, you may find better reliability. But there's a lot of nuance to that. And this is Smart Home 101. So that controller has to speak what is essentially the same language as that motion sensor. This will allow it to receive the signal from the motion sensor that motion was detected. Then the controller knows what is a device ID for that sensor. It also knows the name you gave the sensor as well. So it's able to look in its list of automations and see that when the motion sensor sees someone moving, that it should cause an action to take place. Let's say that the motion sensor is supposed to turn on this light. Let's also say that our controller allows us to set the color and to set the brightness of this light. That's really three actions happening, but depending on how your app works, it might appear as just one, and you might think that it's just one. However, that is three actions taking place that change how that light bulb is behaving. So again, that light bulb has to be previously connected to the controller. The controller has to speak the same language as the light bulb and the motion sensor. Both have to be online and available or connected to the controller. And then the controller sends out those actions to the light bulb and the light bulb knows how to deal with that message. So we have talked about these magical languages happening without us being able to see them. And that is because most of your smart home will communicate wirelessly. You won't see it happen, obviously, and you won't have to run any wires in a lot of cases. There are many different wireless communication technologies being used today. The terms you will hear are Wi-Fi, Zigbee, Z-Wave, Thread, Bluetooth, and these days in an ever increasing amount, you will hear something called Matter, which is actually just a way to use some of those technologies in what is being touted as a consumer-friendly way. The jury's still out there. There will be opportunities for you to wire in certain products with Ethernet or Cat5 or 6 cabling, which is great to do if you can, but again, that won't happen a ton. What goes into a smart home and what each component does is something that I get asked about a lot. And even for people who are really experienced with smart homes and connected technology like this, they tend to not know how all of the components can work together. Plus, they tend to not even know what's available today. In all of my fantastic artistic glory, here is your home. Today, it probably has all kinds of products that are both smart and not smart, but let's go through the major components of a smart home. 
The first device to know about is your home's modem. This definitely was provided to you by your internet service provider and it's the first device in your network because it takes the cable from the outside world and turns it into an ethernet cable that runs to the next networking component, your home's router. The modem isn't usually something you need to deal with, but sometimes your ISP will combine your modem and router, so watch out for that. Your router is often one of the most overlooked and important components of your smart home. It could have also been given to you by your ISP, and if it wasn't, then you're pretty familiar with the device. You might also decide that your Wi-Fi coverage off of that router is not good enough, and so you might buy a Wi-Fi extender or you might buy a mesh Wi-Fi system. We already talked about that smart home controller, which could be a hub or smart speakers or all of the above. These will connect to your home's router, oftentimes by a wired internet connection, but in some cases they can be wireless. Smart speakers tend to be wireless, while smart home hubs tend to have a wired connection. If you remember from the previous section, I said that those hubs can communicate in a lot of wireless technologies, and different ones will communicate using different wireless technologies. Those wireless technologies will be used for what I will call four classes of devices. Those four classes are sensors, actors, combo devices, and control points. In terms of sensors, today you will find a lot of motion sensors and contact sensors. I've already explained that motion sensors are normally passive infrared, but sometimes you will find motion sensors that are intended to work outdoors. Contact sensors are normally a very simple device known as a reed switch. With those, you can sense the open or closed status of a door or a window or more. And that's because this smaller piece is almost always just a magnet. The other side or the larger side of a contact sensor contains the transceiver or what can send and receive messages and it contains the switch which will open or close depending on how close the magnet is. That's what gives you the open and close status, which is then sent back to your controller. There are temperature sensors, humidity sensors and leak sensors, vibration sensors, light or luminosity sensors, UV sensors, air quality sensors, and I've even watched other creators make radiation sensors. A newer type of sensor and something that we will see expanded more and more is called a presence sensor. These are oftentimes a type of radar, and you will actually find a type of radar inside of Google Nest Hub, which can sense how your sleep has gone. There will be much more development on the side of radar and other sensing technologies that will be more specific as we go forward, but for now, the types of sensors I just talked about are the ones that you will generally find and be able to use fairly easily. The second type of device I called actors. These are devices that take commands and cause something to happen. Smart lighting is one of the first things that a lot of people look at and you can range anywhere from light bulbs to LED strips, light switches and more. There are smart lighting fixtures like lamps and while we talk about lamps we can talk about smart plugs and smart power bars as well as specialized equipment that can actually dim your standard lamp, lamp itself. A lot of people like to get smart blinds or smart shades and I even have some smart curtains. You probably have switches in your home that run a little motor like a fan in your bathroom or an overhead fan. Those are also action devices and there are specialized appliances like fridges, humidifiers, AC units, heaters, fans, diffusers and so many more devices. Honestly anything today that you buy for your home probably has a smart version if it's something that you plug in. Another action device is what's called an IR controller. Your television today probably uses an IR remote and those kinds of controllers would be able to cause things to happen with that television or other device with that IR controller. There are other products called RF controllers. RF just stands for radio frequency. In most cases, this is just another wireless technology, but you might have remotes in your home that use a certain frequency, and these types of controllers can blast out those signals at that frequency. The third type of smart home device is a combo device. These are products that can be used on both the sensor side 
and the action side. The truth is that almost everything I talked about on the action side can be used that way. For example, when a smart bulb turns on, your smart home controller can know that and react, so it's a sensor of a different type. It's not that useful, so we tend to call those action devices, but it's good to know that you have that option. A smart plug is another good example of a combo device, but this one gets a little more complicated because there are energy monitoring smart plugs that can sense the amperage or watts being used. That's definitely a sensor function, and you will even find some smart power bars capable of this. Cameras and smart doorbells are probably one of the most commonly used combo devices. Obviously, you're going to be able to find out if there's motion in front of a camera. And in a lot of cases, companies will give you different detection features like people, vehicles, or animal detection. However, they also become action devices because you can record videos, turn them on or off, have them play messages in some instances, or turn on lighting attached to them. And obviously with things like smart doorbells, you can communicate with people. There's a lot these can do, but you definitely use them on both sides of your automations. Thermostats are another great example of a combo device as they can sense what the temperature is and then usually take action on their own using your HVAC system. The same holds true for a smart lock as they can often tell you the status of your door lock and in some cases, even the status of your door. Plus, they can be locked or unlocked. Within this third type of device are multifunction products. And I think a great example of this is this siren from Zoos. It actually has a couple of sensors on it, but it's a siren, so it can play a really loud sound. The fourth type of device is something that I think is underutilized in a lot of cases, but becomes really important for most people over time. These are control interfaces. They can range from smart buttons that maybe you just press to smart dials that you can usually press and or rotate. There are a lot of smart buttons that have multiple buttons on them and in a lot of cases you'll be able to click and double click or hold or all of the above. The apps on your phone become a control interface for you and there are aggregator apps that allow you to bring all your smart products into them and control from that app. Those apps are often tied to a smart home controller though, and a specialized type of smart controller is a smart speaker, which will give you voice control in most cases, as well as that app. There are certain companies that make a smart display that is really just a smart speaker with a screen on it, but these give you another interface to control your smart home off of. Then there are televisions or smart streaming devices that allow you to control your smart home like an Amazon Fire TV stick, an Android or Google TV device, or an Apple TV. All of those give you some interfaces and usually some smart voice control for your smart home as well. Then we can talk about DIY solutions or even DIY solutions that will go onto phones or tablets as either a specialized app or a web page you go to. I am most familiar with sharp tools and action tiles as I have often used Samsung SmartThings as a hub in my home and those connect to that and provide you the ability to create your own display for controlling your home. And again, I, I think it's important to understand that companies continue to develop different sensor types as well as new action devices. The combo devices keep getting made in different configurations with new features getting added all the time. Control interfaces are updated all the time with software and there are new hardware versions coming all the time too. There are lots of accessories that can go with your smart home and a couple of great examples are storage systems for videos or from certain security cameras or perhaps networking equipment that helps you to better manage your network at home. While this video is only Smart Home 101 and can't contain all of the details you'll need to pick the big components of your smart home, I will break down how you should choose some of those big components and give you some ideas of your best options. You will notice I keep going back to Wi-Fi and your router or a mesh Wi-Fi system in your home as being so important. A lot of your home will be based off of that network and off of those components of your home, so that's why. There are three major aspects of a Wi-Fi system that I think is really important for a smart home. 
The first is that you can cover your home with Wi-Fi. Use mesh Wi-Fi instead of extenders if you need to expand your network and prioritize wired connections between your mesh Wi-Fi system if you have that opportunity. Probably the most important aspect of your Wi-Fi system is how many devices can be connected and stay connected to it. Reviews of the fastest router or the fastest Wi-Fi system only tell you one aspect of what matters for a smart home. This is actually why I had the Eero 6 Plus system and went back to my Google Nest Wi-Fi system. The Eero's I had had a limit of 75 devices on the whole network, whereas Google had 100 devices per node, and I flirt with those limits. There are two nice-to-haves when we talk about Wi-Fi systems. That extra level of speed or Wi-Fi 6 slash 6E are definitely nice to have. Most smart home products still connect to Wi-Fi at 2.4 gigahertz and smart speakers and cameras connect at 5 gigahertz in most cases. There's no smart home device I know with Wi-Fi 6 yet, plus the speeds smart products need, they're not that high. The other nice to have feature, or what I would call feature number three, is a radio for another wireless networking technology. One of the nice things of that Eero system was that it had a thread radio and in the future should be fully matter compatible. And that matter compatibility is going to become more and more important as we go forward. But as of the release of this video, that standard is not launched and we don't know the level of success it will have in the marketplace. However, I recommend for most people that you are at least aware of whether or not a product will have that matter compatibility come October 2022. In terms of smart home control systems, or the hubs or the speakers that we have talked about, there are many things to consider. So instead of giving you all the details about them, I'm going to break down some of the big things you'll want to consider for each system. I will go from less complex to more complex in terms of the system we're talking about. So this is meant to give you a little push in the direction of the system or systems you might want to employ, but it can't give you everything. Apps like If This Then That can be useful, but the big thing you want to consider is that it's entirely cloud-based, which means it requires the internet to be available in your home all the time. That can lower reliability. The good news though is it's just an app on your phone so it's very easy and they do have a lot of products that can be connected to the service. Automations are generally easy to create and no hardware is required, but there is a subscription service after just three automations. The wild thing about If This Then That though is once you have a subscription, it can get incredibly advanced with the automations you create. That's if you know how to script a bit. Next up is Google Home, which is at its basis an application that can connect thousands of smart home products to your home. You won't find many products that don't connect to the application and of course their smart speakers employ the Google Assistant. The Google Assistant is the best voice assistant in the world and it gives you access to incredible information and some nice connections to the rest of your life, but you will find the automation side of this system very lacking. Google has really lagged behind other companies because your routines or automations cannot be started by sensors or really any smart product in your home, including buttons. Another major drawback is that most of what you do with Google Home requires the internet to be available, and this does mean slower responses in many cases, and again that reliability discussion comes into play. Nest products are owned by Google and are best suited for use with this app though. Also, most of Google's problems should be fixed as the Matter standard comes out, as they have thread radios on many smart speakers and have promised much better automation options. Apple's HomeKit is only available on iOS devices, an iPhone and iPad, which is a big issue if you use Android phones in your life. It's pretty much a hard stop at that point. You will mostly use the Home app and what is called Siri shortcuts, although there are some third-party apps that work with HomeKit and give nice automation options. Apple TV or Apple's HomePods can be used as hubs to connect to smart home products, and Apple's Siri is actually the second most accurate voice assistant today, 
despite people thinking otherwise. There are some good automation options, but the depth of automations you can make sometime, it sometimes leaves users a bit out of luck. The other big problem with HomeKit is that Apple has limited the products that work with HomeKit, so you will find your options limited and often way more expensive. One big benefit of Apple is that their HomePod mini contains a thread radio, and they do seem very ready for the upcoming Matter standard. So that number could explode, or the number of products that work with Apple HomeKit. One other nice thing about Apple HomeKit is that much of it is local, which means it won't always require the internet to be available. I think at a basis you can say Apple HomeKit is great at what it does, but it doesn't do everything. Which brings us to the, what is almost the exact opposite product lineup, which is Amazon and their Miss A application. That app works with its Echo speakers, Fire TV sticks, and Amazon now has a number of companies like Ring, Blink, and even Amazon Basics products that connect and work well together. Plus, Amazon has the most compatibility in the industry when it comes to smart home products. That means everything out there today can basically be connected to their app. Echo speakers like this one sometimes have other radios like Zigbee and in the future Thread and they even have their own standard called Amazon Sidewalk that allows for long range communication. So they're just the most compatible smart home system today. Amazon has some good routine or automation options, although the complexity doesn't quite reach the level of hubs we'll talk about in a moment. It's often enough for most people and for what they want to do, and with so many products to choose from, you can usually find one that's going to fit your use case. There are a few drawbacks with Amazon though, as their app has always been pretty weak and quite frankly annoying to use. Plus their voice assistant is definitely in third when compared to Google and Apple, and there has been a pretty significant shift by Amazon to get people into Ring subscriptions or Amazon subscriptions, and that's on top of Amazon Prime. Plus there's additional tiers of things like music and video subscriptions, so it's kind of like being nickel and dime to death, or that's how it feels sometimes. And that's before Amazon uses these speakers to try and sell you stuff, which they do. Still, this is likely the best balance for features versus cost on the market today, and that's one of the big reasons Amazon owns a lot of the smart home market today. Which brings me to the first true smart home hub and the one that I use the most in my home. That is Samsung SmartThings, which has gone through a lot of changes over the past two to three years, but I will describe it as the easiest smart home hub that still has depth. That depth can put it on the level of really complex DIY solutions if you need it to be that. Why people often shy away from smart things is actually based on rumors or statements that aren't true. You'll find videos and articles stating smart things is dead or that the platform requires the internet to run all the time. Those aren't true statements if you know what you're doing. And that's where this system can be a little more effort versus everything I've talked about before it as you have to learn those nuances and you might have to watch a tutorial or two. Good thing I have a YouTube channel. You will want a hub as it contains many radios and in the future you will have hubs on things like Samsung fridges, televisions and more of their appliance. So it's actually likely you will end up with smart things in your home without even trying. The automation options have good depth, as you can have multiple conditions and multiple actions occur. Plus, you can do really advanced things like create virtual switches, scripts using WebCore, and even create your own DIY control interface. The SmartThing Smart Home Monitor is still one of the only true self-monitored security solutions available today without a subscription, and some cameras can be used with this system. The real drawbacks here are that Samsung has tried to tie smart things to Bixby, which is their voice assistant. I wouldn't even put that on a list of the top four if I didn't have to. And with all the changes that have gone on recently with smart things, there have been some losses in terms of flexibility. It's also meant some products have lost compatibility and we've seen companies like Ring or Amazon not continue their compatibility in all cases. So you will find some products that don't work with smart things. 
Still, like I said, this is what I use in my home and I think it bridges the gap between complexity and function. That next level of complexity is on a hub called Hubitat. This is a bridge between hubs like SmartThings and the real DIY world of home automation. It contains some really advanced automation features, including a rules engine that is extremely powerful and actually easy to use once you dig in. The unfortunate part for Hubitat is that you can't really connect cameras and the app is extremely weak. The way you build everything is on a web page that is hosted on the hub, so you end up needing to create your own control interfaces or to pair the hub with another system like Google or Amazon for ease of control. The really nice thing about Hubitat though is just about everything is done on the hub. And it has a couple of radios to give you that local connectivity and local execution of automations. For me, I want to see Hubitat come forward and create better experiences and more connectivity, as it's definitely weak in those areas, but I have seen that needle starting to move with the system, so it's an interesting one to watch going forward. Then we come to a system that is really being built from the ground up, and I would liken it a lot to Linux in its early years. It's the most flexible and it's the most powerful at the moment, but it is incredibly complex to use, especially when compared to the other systems. This is called Home Assistant, and I will probably get yelled at in the comments because it's almost like a religion at this point. The truth is I don't know where Home Assistant is going in the long run and I hope that the business model is sustainable and that developers creating the features for this system won't get bored or tired or annoyed at the project. It seems like it has good momentum now and again, people who are into this system tend to really love it. However, for most of you, Coding to create deep automations in your home isn't your pastime. It's not that all automations require you to code, but there is significant effort involved in using the incredible features of Home Assistant. It's not that the easy stuff isn't that easy to do, it's that the hard stuff is really hard. So for me, I just don't think that the time commitment is worth what you're putting into Home Assistant, but that's up to you. So if you want to tinker and you want to perfect things, this is definitely the system for you. The control interfaces and dashboards look amazing and the intricacy of automations are where we want all of the other smart home systems to get. But one big thing that will stop you from getting started with Home Assistant today is deciding how you'll run it. You can pre-order a hub called Yellow and I bought one called Blue that cost me an incredible amount of money to get to Canada. I think it was 500 bucks. But it's more likely that you'll run it off a computer or a server, a network drive, or build your own with a Raspberry Pi. So while they are moving to a product you can just purchase to get started, it's definitely not like buying anything else I've talked about. Once you've decided to use one or potentially even a combination of these systems, that's when you can head down the path of buying other products and having them work seamlessly in your home and with that system or system. This is where we can talk about complementary companies or companies that are trying to produce a whole home system. These are often something that you can use to supplement your smart home. Probably the closest to being a whole home solution comes from Acara. They mostly produce Zigbee devices and in the future, Thread products. These are all relatively reliable when used right. They have their own hubs, cameras, sensors, light switches, buttons, and more, and this is a strong option to pair with Apple HomeKit, although other pairings leave a little to the imagination due to reduced automation options. One of the cheapest solutions in North America is Wise. They have a ton of smart home products, but don't quite have the ability to control everything for you yet. Their cameras are good budget options, although nowadays you'll find subscriptions hitting you often with Wise, which makes them more expensive over the long run than you might think. Surprisingly, you can get to home security with this company in a relatively inexpensive way, and I would say that they pair best with Amazon. 
One of my personal favorites is SwitchBot simply because they keep bringing new types of smart devices to market that are innovative. They're also getting closer and closer to being a whole home control system as they are rounding out their offerings with more typical smart home products. They don't quite have the security thing done but are a really good pairing with either Google or Amazon. Yolink is a really interesting option in the market today because it's inexpensive and incredibly long range. You can be a quarter mile from your home and still have these products stay connected to their hub. They have unique products that no one else has and they even have a local direct pairing option that gives you a local backup of many automations. They also can do things like security, but their app is not the best and other automations on the hub do require the internet. Tuya, or the Smart Life app, is a huge ecosystem of products. It's too complicated to explain everything here, but Tuya makes software and firmware that companies can use to build their own products. In fact, Tuya now has their platform embedded in many brands that you wouldn't think would be based on Tuya. But you can usually tell because the apps look like this. Many of those products go into the Smart Life app and you can find hubs that give you deeper automation options. These products are often best paired with Google or Amazon for other control, but I want you to understand that each product needs specific research on what and how it works with other systems. Plus, you need to really watch quality in some cases. Ring is owned by Amazon and those products definitely work best with Echo speakers and other Amazon products. Ring really is based in security, but they do have some other great lighting and home automation systems. They almost always get you on a subscription plan though, so watch your budgets. Lutron is a wonderful addition to any smart home because of lighting, fan, and just general smart home control, but they do need a hub. They connect and work with just about everything, and speaking of working with everything, Philips Hue is the best lighting system in terms of connectivity, and it's also one of the most reliable. New products come out all the time, but you'll want their hub. They are also very expensive, but there's no easier platform to buy into that lets you shift your overall smart home to anything you want, anytime. Everything else you talk about from a brand perspective is definitely complimentary, and you'll need to research how and what they work with before buying. The other topic to talk about are some of the systems like Control 4 or Savant. These are whole home control systems that require a professional installer and are very expensive. I don't often talk about these solutions because they are that expensive and you do have that guidance from the installer as well as usually service costs. So let's put this all together and show you how your smart home will start to look as you build it out and what you might run into. Your router will be your internet connection and it usually has Wi-Fi on it. So it will connect to some of these smart home products either wired or wirelessly. You will have a smart home controller and most of you will not just use an app or a web service to do that. In fact, it's likely you'll end up with a few hubs, even though the matter standard folks are telling us you won't need to. You still will. That can mean, depending on your router, that you'll need a little network switch or maybe a few. If you have Ethernet ca cabling throughout your home, this becomes more likely and please do take advantage of cabled connections wherever you can. If you have a bigger home, you'll likely end up with a mesh Wi-Fi system instead of a single router. Please don't use Wi-Fi extenders unless you like a smart home that doesn't work. Then around those things is how you should start to build your smart home. Don't start with a smart thermostat or a smart video doorbell or a smart lock. Get those other things in place first. They will give you the foundation and will help you decide which products to buy. As you add those other products, you will be adding capabilities to your home, but you will find that a smart video doorbell on its own might not be enough for you. You might want an outdoor motion sensor as a backup or to tell you when someone has reached a very specific spot. You might want a smart package delivery box. You'll probably want smart lighting to change when someone is at the door too. 
this will require your controller to be capable of all of that and you will have to research each product individually to make sure it'll fit in and do the things you want. The complexity of the system will grow, but as long as you're carefully picking the products, the complexity won't get beyond what most people can handle. You will also be able to use that complexity to your advantage. For example, when someone walks up to my home, I don't change any lighting until they get to the front door. I let a motion sensor trigger my lighting to change for a few minutes when they get to the door. Then they can uh, ring the doorbell, which will alert me on my smart speakers throughout my home, and that will change things inside of my home as well. Those smart speakers will always play the sound if the doorbell rings, except for the one in my bedroom, which turns on a do not disturb mode late at night. The lights in my home will only change between sunset and midnight as I don't need lights during the day for people who walk up to my home and I don't find that I need lights to change when I'm up and about. So you will use that complexity to fit your life and might that, that might require a few additional devices or it might require you to get a bit creative. One of the other things that you will do over time is you will give yourself more ways to control your home. and these devices overall. I recommend smart displays over smart speakers in general, although they are not very customizable. So if you want to get really custom with your displays, you want to do something yourself. Which brings me to the next topics that you will need. This is Smart Home 101, so it's not going to take you all the way down the path, but if you are ready to continue your journey, then I have a playlist that expands on the topics we talked about today. It includes the continuation of topics like easy, reliable Wi-Fi, even for those non-technical folks, which voice assistant fits your home the best, products that will work with everything you will buy, plus topics like the matter standard and what that will change in your home. It's really the best advice I can give for building a smart home the right way. So click over here or tap to make sure you move in the right direction. Otherwise, thanks for watching today, and of course, don't hate, automate.